Oi! My name is Simon White. I'm co-founder of Vera Perception, which is a macroeconomic research company. And our aim is to look for leading economic relationships so that we can find actionable trading ideas. And really what we're trying to get away from is a kind of guru approach to economic research. So we're very data-driven and we're agnostic. And we try and come up with um, repeatable and resilient processes so that our clients can understand our process and so therefore it's something they can you know, understand for themselves and at the end of the day, trust. So current monetary policy, I think, is failing for a number of reasons. We've been in this situation since the great financial crisis. We've had so-called unconventional monetary policy. Um, we've had lower and lower rates. We've had zero rates. We've had negative rates. And we've also had uh, large-scale asset programs, quantitative easing. And they really haven't worked. And the reason is, is the fundamental issue here is the private sector is desire to run a saving surplus. So the private sector, since the great financial crisis, has been running a savings surplus. Now, there might be a number of reasons for that. I'd say foremost might be the fact that the financial crisis was so severe, it basically created such uh, an effect on these companies. They're still licking their wounds and still trying to rebuild their balance sheets. So monetary policy is really there to try and, if you like, persuade these uh, companies to try and reduce their saving surpluses. And that is what it's not been able to do. You take lower rates. Uh, that's basically not worked for three main reasons, I would say. So the first of all is what's called the income substitution effect. So the closer you get to the zero bound, when you have a sector that desires to save, that means that they have to essentially save more and more to maintain the same level of income. So it starts becoming counterproductive. Um, the second thing is uh, the wealth effect. You know, you're seeing greater wealth concentration um, across the world. And again, you can speculate some of the reasons. You might say that, for instance, if you look at the tech companies, it takes fewer and fewer people to create you know, a lot more capital than it used to. You could also blame monetary policy itself, QE, for the rise in wealth inequality. And that means the pervasive impact of lowering rates is much uh, less effective than it once was. And the third reason, and this is the one that's obviously in vogue uh, quite a lot today, is negative rates. They, um, if anything, are deflationary. And the main reason is, is because of the impact they have on banks. You know, banks under conventional monetary policy are the, if you like, the transmission mechanism. So they're the things that you're supposed to transmit monetary policy. But when you have negative rates, because banks are kind of loath to cut rates to negative on retail depositors, their net interest margins are getting squeezed and they're getting squeezed further and further. And that means ultimately they have uh, lower profits, they have less retained earnings, and then that means that ultimately they can lend less. So the whole thing starts to become counterproductive. And in fact, there was a, a good piece of um, uh, research from the University of Bath recently, and they looked at 7,500 banks across 30 OECD countries, banks that have been impacted by um, negative interest rate policy. And over the period of negative interest rates, on average, their net interest margins fell by 16%, and their return on assets fell by 3%. So it's kind of clear that these policies uh, not only aren't working, they're becoming counterproductive. You take uh, QE, the other main policy that we've seen since the great financial crisis. Now, that's also been uh, ineffectual in trying to persuade the private sector to reduce its savings surplus. All it's really done is cause the private sector to change the composition of its savings. So the central bank buys government debt, it bids up government debt, the private sector basically then exchanges one savings vehicle, which is government debt, for another savings vehicle, which is reserves. So the overall level of uh, savings remains the same, but the composition changes. And as I mentioned earlier, you have the kind of political toxicity effect from QE because it's probably adding to a huge amount of wealth inequality. So it's quite clear from these reasons that monetary policy, current monetary policy, isn't working. So. You know, that leads us down the path of if current monetary policy isn't working, what are some of the alternatives? Now, the one that's very much in vogue right now is MMT. You know, everyone's talking about that. It stands for Modern Monetary Theory, and it's as old as the hills, really. You know, it's kind of nothing more than good old-fashioned monetary financing. And in a nutshell, really, it's just um, central bank financing of government deficits. That's all really MMT is. Now, governments can uh, fund themselves in two ways. They can do so through taxation and they can do so through borrowing. And under MMT, um, the government is supposed to essentially borrow uh, without limit. So don't pay attention to your deficits or your debt or anything like that uh, until you reach full, full employment. 
that's the point where you're supposed to stop. Taxation just really takes the place of what conventional monetary policy did before. Taxation is really there to basically simulate or dampen the economy and to redistribute income. Um, the only really overall constraint of MMT is basically what are the productive limits of the economy. So you're supposed to stop when the economy is at the level where if you start to produce any more, it becomes inflationary. But that's the big question. Does anyone know when that point is? So MMT and QE are, are very different beasts. You know, uh, QE uh, creates the supply of money, but uh, crucially, it doesn't create the demand. It doesn't create the demand for that money. So what you end up with is lots of uh, reserves sloshing around the system, but not really having any impact on the real economy. MMT is very different. It creates the supply of money, but it also creates the demand through the government purchases of goods and services. And just because QE is not inflationary, that doesn't mean to say, and by that, of course, I mean it doesn't create consumer inflation. Of course, it creates a lot of asset price inflation. But just because QE has not been inflationary, people shouldn't be lulled into a false sense of security that MMT also won't be inflationary. Now, I think MMT will be very inflationary. Why is that? Well, there's kind of three main reasons I would say. First of all, under MMT, they say that deficits don't matter. It's also said that debt, total debt, doesn't matter. And the government, as I mentioned earlier, is supposed to know kind of when to stop stimulating, you know, at that point when you reach full unemployment, or full employment, sorry. Um, taking the last part first, you know, is it possible for anyone to know where that point is? I would argue no, ex ante, to know when an employment, when an economy is going to hit full employment. Um, and even if you did catch it at the right moment, you know, it's very difficult. You have a little bit of inflation, but inflation is like toothpaste. You know, once it's out the tube, it's much harder to put back in. But I would also argue that the last person you want trying to make that decision is a government. You know, central bank independence was all about trying to take this away from governments. Governments have an inherent inflationary bias. Their main aim is to essentially win elections. How do they win elections? They do that by buying votes. They buy votes by essentially spending uh, money on sections of the electorate. And how do they pay for that? Well, they'd rather not tax because that might lose them votes on the other side. So they borrow. So they have this situation where they tend to borrow, um, you know, seemingly without limit and don't pay attention to the deficit. So they're inherently inflationary actors, if you like. So I think that's going to be very difficult. When you look at um, deficits, deficits are supposed to matter, of course. When your deficit is too big, that seems to sort of give some impression that um, the government's spending too much and you're going to end up hitting inflation. Uh, MMT says this doesn't matter, but if you look at basically the composition of debt, most countries like the US, for instance, a third of outstanding USTs are owned by the foreign sector. The foreign sector will pay attention to the fact that you're running massive budget deficits. Then people might say, well, you know, look at Japan. You know, Japan's already down that route. Well, the big difference there is that the Fed owns only like 11% of outstanding debt, so we're a long way off that point. Even in Japan, the, uh, JG, uh, sorry, the BOJ owns 50% of JGBs. So, you know, even then, we're a long way off from the fact where you can say that deficits don't actually matter. And then the final point, I think this is very important, is um, debt, you know, the total debt load, debt to GDP, also ultimately matters and you know you, you to find out about this you look to uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff's great book you know this time is different so they looked at you know financial crises going back sort of like two centuries and what they discovered is that when your debt to GDP ratio goes above 90 percent you tend to get higher interest rates and um, you know and a response to that from someone who's maybe an MMT supporter might then be, well, why would you ever default on your debt if you just owe it to yourself? Like, if the central bank is facilitating this borrowing, why would you ever default? Well, the response to that then, if you look at his hist the history again, in what uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have written, you do get domestic defaults. They do happen. There's been, you know, three or four in the last 20 years. You've had Jamaica has done it twice. You've had uh, uh, Bolivia in, uh, sorry, um, Estonia in the late 90s. You've also had Argentina in 2001. So they do happen, and also what they point out in their book is that inflation in the run-up to a domestic default is much, much higher than the run-up to an external default. So, you know, you have a number of reasons to suggest that what is considered not to matter does matter. What are some, you know, concrete examples? Well, I'd say the 20th century is littered with examples of inflation. Um, and a fantastic book that we've recommended to our clients is called Monetary Regimes and Inflation 
by a guy called Peter Bernholz, who's a professor at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And what he does is he examines all the main high and hyper inflations of the 20th century and tried to look for what he considered to be similar characteristics within them. And what he noticed was every one of them was preceded by uh, central bank financing of large government deficits. And specifically what he noticed is when the budget deficit exceeds 40% of government expenditures and the central bank is monetizing this, in every situation where this happened, it led to a high or hyperinflationary episode. And the interesting case today is Japan. You know, Japan is probably furthest along the path of like the major economies that's closest to um, you know, going down sort of MMT-like policies. And interesting about Japan is uh, everyone thinks they hold it up as a reason for not to worry about MMT because Japan has never had inflation. But if you look under the hood, Japan has actually been sailing very close to the inflationary wind. So back in 2012 to 2015, they were running a budget deficit that was over 40% of expenditures, maybe just a smidgen above, but crucially it was above. But at that point, they weren't really monetizing many of these expenditures. Then the monetization started to rise later on in the decade, but the budget deficit uh, ratio, you know, as a ratio of expenditure, started to fall again. So although it looked like they got away with it, if you look under the surface, they were actually sailing very close to the inflationary wind. And that's why I think Japan is going to be the place to watch. It's going to be like the canary in the coal mine to see if and when uh, MMT policies go too far. So I think you can have a situation where obviously if everybody's trying to do the same policies, um, you know, that will obviously mute the impact. I think it will probably happen in stages. So, you know, my, this is very difficult to sort of speculate in this stuff at so longer term. I certainly think Japan's at the front of the queue. I think there you will find um, them sort of pushing uh, the situation further than other countries. But it's clear the path that places like Eurozone and America are wanting to take. They're wanting to go down that path. So I think what will happen is it will be a progressive series of currency collapses. But I also think that when someone has seen what happens to Japan, there may obviously be a reaction to that and there might be some rolling back. I mean, the thing is, though, what do you then do, right? If you've already hit the limits of conventional monetary policy, you're going back to fiscal policy or, fisc or central bank-enabled fiscal policy, you know, what's the alternative after that? So it might just be a case of they try and rein it in a little bit more. But clearly the risk is that the problem is with MMT is that the people in charge of that policy are not the ones that are the best able to know when to not to push that policy too far. And that's why you can end up with these inflationary episodes. I think it's something that um, you know, happens, uh, you know, as I say, you go from a disinflationary episode which causes the behaviour of the central actors, central banks, governments, to become more inflationary. And you take Japan as, as an example. You know, I think that the uh, ultimate end game in Japan is, is very high inflation, as I say, the way that the policies that they're doing. But how do you get there? And the way uh, I think about it is like the road to hyperinflation is paved with deflation. So what will probably happen is that we have a very deflationary episode in Japan, one that's extremely bad, that pushes their currency extremely strongly. So the dollar yen falls a great deal. They have a very, very major kind of slowdown in their economy. And that essentially causes them to take you know, a, a full caution to the wind and ease on a scale that they've never eased before. So I think you have to see that sort of disinflation and deflation before you get to that inflation. But arguably, you know, we're already kind of there. You know, even in the whole Western world, we obviously talk about sector stagnation. Sector stagnation really is kind of harking back to what we were saying earlier. That's that private sector is not willing to draw down its surplus. I mean, Japan has been in that situation since the late 80s. You know, they had their crisis in the late 80s, the early 90s. Their corporate sector is still running this huge surplus. So, you know, the fundamental reasons are there, secular stagnation and low inflation. You may not even need to see a severe deflationary episode. Already the kind of wheels are turning that people realize that this isn't enough. The structural limits of conventional monetary policy have been reached. And the central banks are now just throwing their arms up almost in uh, despair. They're saying, we need help because we cannot fix the productivity. We cannot fix the uh, structural high employment. So, you know, we're already running along that path. So what's the implications of, to markets for these sort of policies? Well, I think that it's going to turn a lot of things on its head. Um, but I see three main kind of structural themes from the shift away from conventional monetary policy towards um, MMT-like policies. And just to make something clear, this isn't going to happen overnight, and we're not going to hit full MMT overnight, but there's a clear kind of progression towards these sort of policies. And the three main structural changes I foresee is the long boom in financial assets versus real assets, I think, will come to an end.
and real assets will begin to outperform financial assets. I think uh, cross-asset volatility will begin to rise on average, and I think we'll see more frequent bursts higher in volatility. And also I see because the tail risks are shifting from lower inflation to higher inflation, um, that means that the risk of higher short-term rates will be higher. So that makes leverage a much more of a dangerous game. So when it comes to financial assets, you know, why are they going to begin to underperform? Well, you look back to the 70s. 70s is a great kind of poster child for you know, long-term kind of high inflation. You know, it was pockmarked with double-digit inflation and stagnating growth. And you look at which assets performed the best, which asset classes performed the best and the worst. Best performing assets were commodities and the worst were equities. And in fact, the only asset that actually gave you a positive real return in that decade was commodities. Equities, on the other hand, became like a shunned asset. You know, very simplistically speaking, if you think about an, e uh, an equity as a kind of infinite maturity bond, you had the higher rates to deal with the inflation, the present value of these things just got absolutely decimated. Nobody wanted to hold them. And even though in price terms, the market bottomed in 1974 in equities, PEs didn't actually bottom until the early 80s. So they really were not an asset that people wanted to hold, collectively speaking. But within uh, equities, there was actually some quite interesting trends. So the equity sectors that did the best were the ones that either owned real assets or benefited from real assets. So energies and industrials uh, did the best in that decade. They were the best performing sectors. At the other end of the scale, you had the banks. The banks you know, really struggle. Banks are kind of nominal machines. You know, they borrow short term and they lend long term. And they are in a very difficult environment, in rising rate environment. And it kind of makes sense you know, going forward. Banks have kind of benefited from this uh, you know, low rate environment where they're able to provide leverage to boost financial assets. If these things go into reverse, the kind of whole business model of banks is going to be challenged. They're going to find life much more difficult unless they overhaul their business model. And another, uh, I think, very important theme here is the kind of traditional portfolio construction. I think that's going to come under immense pressure. So you have risk parity or you have the traditional 60-40, which is kind of risk parity-like. They've benefited for years from the negative correlation of stocks and bonds. But that's not really the normal state of affairs. You know, over the last 100 years, 70% of the time, that correlation has been positive. And what you notice is that as rates go higher and inflation heads higher, and that's what you gradually expect to see under MMT, that correlation reverts back to positive. And that whole concept where you're, be you're benefiting from the diversification effects doesn't exist anymore. And that has great changes for the markets too, because the 60-40 kind of thing, that's been a major kind of volatility dampener for the, um, for the markets, right, along with the risk parity. Whenever um, volatility falls, they essentially have to buy more assets to rebalance. So there's this kind of self-fulfilling effect. So these guys are essentially short vol, and their short stock bond correlation. And as these things reverse, you expect all these things to begin to go higher. So really kind of challenging what people's general kind of view of markets have been for the last 30 or 40 years. Banks are going to struggle because of this, um, you know, tail risks essentially shifting. Because in the last 30 or 40 years, you could basically be reliant on the fact that although rates might go higher, the general trend was, was lower. We just had a series of lower lows. Um, in an environment where the tail risks shift to higher inflation, the risk is always going to be we're going to have bursts higher in shorter term rates. And that, I think, makes the bank business model extremely difficult because not only is it difficult for them, as I say, they're borrowing uh, shorter term uh, uh, assets, essentially they're borrowing in a shorter term period and lending longer term, they also have, they provide leverage to other people. And if there's less demand for leverage, they're really unable to provide that in the same way that they would like to. So the whole kind of last 30 or 40 years, if you like, the, the dominating times of banking is kind of, will, will be very difficult under those circumstances. So it's really about, not about what instantly happens. As I say, I don't think you'd instantly get higher inflation or instantly see uh, shorter term rates rise, but the kind of risk profile will change and it will really challenge that business model. So the, these structural changes are, are very difficult to really get a handle on when they're going to happen um, because they, they tend to go through, they're like regime shifts. So they don't go smoothly from kind of one sort of uh, version of itself to another version of it. It happens quite suddenly. You know, it happens in the way that Ernest Hemingway talked about how one goes bankrupt. How did it happen? 
first gradually, then suddenly. And the rise to inflation will be like that too. You know, inflation doesn't go smoothly from two to four to six, it goes two to four to 10 to 15%. So it's actually a very difficult thing to kind of get a finger on. But one thing I would look to, I think will give you some at least mild degree of heads up where we're seeing a beginning of change in this environment would be a rise in monetary vol velocity. So I'd begin to see that would start to pick up in advance of any of these structural changes. So when it comes to gold, um, you know, obviously we're seeing interesting moves today. I think that's based on, you know, rather than a kind of, um, we're trying to early factor in MMT-like policies, um, it doesn't really need that. I mean, that will obviously help gold, I think, in the longer term, because its role as an inflation hedge is certainly something you want to consider having in your portfolio. But I think what's boosted it most recently, certainly in the last sort of few months, has been this shift to more negative rates. And you can almost see an uncanny kind of relationship between uh, the price of gold and the outstanding amount of negative yielding debt in the world. So we've seen that negative yielding debt kind of skyrocket and along with it, the price of gold. So I think gold is sort of trying to straddle two things right now, as I say, the negative yielding aspect of things, because obviously, relatively speaking, gold now has positive carry. A lot of people who shunned it now are looking at it as a serious alternative, a serious way to hold some of their investments. Um, but the longer term picture is intact as well, because certainly in an MMT world, with these tail risks of inflation being higher, then gold and other precious metals, uh, it makes a lot of sense to hold them. So I expect to see real assets beginning to outperform financial assets. I expect to see cross-asset volatility rising on average and more frequent bursts higher in volatility. And I expect to see the whole 60-40 portfolio risk parity model challenged as it no longer offers diversification benefits. Um, and really, you know, financial markets are like history. It has eras. And we're really going from one era and we're transitioning to the next right now.